All right, guys, welcome back to A Push Curriculum. We're up to topic 8.13, so we're nearly done with Unit 8. And in this lesson, we're going to cover the environment and natural resources from 1968 to 1980. So let's get into some of the key events uh, dealing with the environment and also how we interacted with the environment. So let's look at some of these environmental concerns and how they help shape our domestic and foreign policies. We're going to begin by looking at a couple of environmental concerns. Now, obviously, environmentalism and conservation have a long history in America. And by the mid-20th century, there was a renewed call to, to re-examine how we interact with the environment and our natural resources. And there was, there was a call to action to do something to kind of clean up the environment, reduce pollution, reduce uh, the amount of uh, natural resources we are consuming. And so let's get into some of those concerns. So we're going to begin with uh, a, a book written in 1962 by a woman named Rachel Carson. The book was called Silent Spring. And what this book was all about was uh, that uh, pesticides were being used extensively across America. And these pesticides were having uh, very awful effects on wildlife, particularly on with birds, which is why the book was called Silent Spring, because uh, what was happening is one of these pesticides in particular, something called DDT, um, when it was consumed uh, in the environment by, by birds, it was causing the birds, when they lay their eggs, that the eggs to be very weak. And so a lot of birds never hatched, and so therefore the, the, the spring would be silent, right? And, and this was, you know, kind of a shock to the system because DDT, as I said, was used extensively across America. It was seen as almost like a miracle uh, insecticide that was, uh, as the science says, um, harmless to humans, but very powerful against insects. And you can, I mean, they would spray it uh, on the beach. They would spray it on the streets. It was everywhere. So let's look at some progress. In 1970, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, was established. And you can see the president signing this into law. That is uh, Richard Nixon. Also during the Nixon administration was the first Earth Day back in 1970. And this becomes uh, you know, an annual event every year where we take time to think about um, how humans interact with the environment, how we can do better, and how we can clean up problems. Also in 1970, the Clean Air Act was passed, which does basically what you'd expect it to. It's going to uh, put new regulations and limits on how much pollution can be put into the environment, into the air specifically. Uh, we're thinking particularly things like factories. Uh, 1972, the Clean Water Act was passed, which does basically the same thing as the Clean Air Act, just for water. And then in 1973, the Endangered Species Act was passed. And so, uh, again, in the early 1970s, we see this flurry of activity, um, and this idea that we have to do something now to protect the environment before it's too late, uh, really gains steam. Now, as much progress as we're making, there were indeed some setbacks. Uh, for example, in 1979, up in Pennsylvania, there was this nuclear power plant called Three Mile Island. And at this nuclear power plant, they had a partial meltdown. Now, meltdown basically refers to a nuclear reactor that becomes overheated and to the point where it can't be controlled. And it, it can result in the release of tremendous amounts of radiation. It can become um, a, a really big disaster. Now, they didn't have a full-fledged meltdown, but they had a partial one. Uh, it was probably the most dangerous moment in history in America in terms of nuclear power and the danger it potentially poses to America. And this really got some people thinking that maybe nuclear power was not worth the, the cost, the, envi the environmental costs. And the thing about nuclear power is it is incredibly efficient, and when it works well, it produces uh, just, again, incredible amounts of electricity with very little environmental impact. But if something goes wrong, it goes horribly wrong, and the effects can last uh, literally for centuries. And so this is, again, it makes people very uncomfortable that maybe nuclear power is not the way forward uh, for Americans. Here is uh, President Jimmy Carter touring uh, the nuclear power plant after the, uh, the disaster. 
All right, so now let's look at uh, our dealings with oil in the 1970s, how America is going to have to adjust to several uh, oil crises. And we're going to begin by looking at 1973. So in 1973, Israel, uh, this country right here, finds itself under attack by its Arab neighbors like it had many other times in the past. And this particular war went, at first anyways, uh, pretty badly for Israel. And it looked like maybe the Arab countries might uh, finally be able to defeat Israel. Uh, but America helps Israel out quite a bit in this war, and the, the country is able to turn things around, and Israel will prevail. However, uh, Arab countries around Israel were furious at America for involving themselves in, again, this war called the Yom Kippur War. So they decided to launch an oil embargo against the United States. In other words, they would refuse to sell oil to the United States. Now, by the 1970s, America was a net oil importer, not exporter. And so we were vulnerable to this kind of stuff. All of a sudden, there was not enough fuel to go around. And this is going to set off in what we call an energy crisis across America. You can see the cars lined up, you know, uh, trying to get gas, and, and there's very little gas to go around. And it was a wake-up call for a lot of Americans that maybe uh, our economy was a lot more vulnerable than we thought it was, and that maybe foreign countries have a lot more power over us than we thought they should, and perhaps the problem is our dependence on oil. And you can see uh, the sign here. Obviously, there's a lot of tension here. Nobody, uh, you know, with, with fuel at an absolute premium, people might uh, decide to take people's fuel. And obviously, the sign telling you not to do that. Now, a couple of consequences of this first oil crisis is uh, the call to action to limit the speed across America. Um, your car is more fuel efficient at 55 miles per hour than it is at 70 miles per hour, and so they lowered the speed limit to 55. And this was something that remained in place all the way into the late 1990s. I, I, I can vividly remember this. Um, you know, whether you're on the interstate or wherever you're at in America, the speed limit was capped at 55 miles per hour. Uh, this also gives Americans an incentive to look for more fuel sources in America itself, such as Alaska. And so the Alaskan pipeline, for example, was was uh, constructed to, to tap uh, the oil that otherwise we would not have access to. All right, so in 1976, we have a presidential election, and Jimmy Carter is, uh, is elected. He was a bit of an outsider in the sense that he had been the governor of Georgia, but he was not a career Washington-type politician. And so for a lot of people, uh, this was kind of a, a, a nice... A uh, nice alternative to the scandals we saw under Nixon and just the typical kind of crony politicians of Washington, D.C. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of hope, I guess we'll say, that the Carter administration will be kind of a new a new era, if you will. Uh, but things go not so well for Jimmy Carter almost immediately. Now, Jimmy Carter comes to the conclusion that a lot of people had already come to that our dependence on foreign oil was at the root of almost all of our economic problems. So, just a quick review, after World War II, our economy began to grow uh, really in unprecedented amounts. I mean, the, the economy was just growing and growing and growing. Basically, for about 20 years after uh, World War II, the economy was growing steadily. And then as we get in the 1970s, that economic uh, growth falters and in fact actually begins to contract in the sense that our economy starts to suffer from inflation. And part of the inflation was the increase in oil prices. Every time oil prices go up dramatically, it causes everything else to go up in price because everything comes back to oil. It's the fuel that carries the goods to and from factories to the store. It's how you get to work. And so if oil goes up, so does everything else. And that leads to inflation. In other words, uh, your money uh, can purchase less now. And that's something that hurts all Americans. So what Carter says is we need to work on energy conservation to make the energy that we have stretch further. So maybe you might want to turn up the thermostat uh, in the summertime. So instead of setting your AC at 70, set it at 75. Or instead of setting your heat at 70 in the winter, set it at 65. And if everybody does these things, then we can uh, make the fuel and energy we have stretch further. 
But these calls really were very unpopular. Americans did not want to have to, um, you know, cut back. They wanted to consume like they always had. Here's a, a good example of, of a change in policy. Uh, we're at the roof of the White House, and Jimmy Carter had, um, as you can see, solar panels uh, placed there on the roof to, to generate electricity, sort of, you know, symbolic of, of what he wanted to see across America as a change from the traditional fuel sources to something new. All right, and then as we close out the decade, guys, in 1979, we have another crisis on our hands. This is going to be a political and energy crisis at the same time. So over in Iran, which is a major oil producer, there was a revolution. And the guy that we had supported since we had basically helped him be put into power uh, back in the 1950s, uh, the Shah of Iran is overthrown. And what replaces him is an Islamic theocracy led by the Ayatollah Khomeini. And the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, was a big um, hater of America. He called us, um, you know, basically the great Satan is what he called uh, the United States, that we were evil and therefore they, we had to be punished for having supported this, this Shah character over Iran. And you can see again uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini on the left and uh, some typical Iranian propaganda on the right. So what Iran decides to do to put pressure on the United States and to punish us for our support of the Shah was to stop, stop selling oil to us. And other OPEC countries began raising their prices as well. Now, OPEC stands for the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. So think of oil-rich countries. Uh, they're kind of working together to set the price of oil. They're going to raise prices. This is going to hurt America and prompt yet another energy crisis. And Americans are fed up get gas shortages across the country. This is, this is twice in a decade we've had this same situation where oil is at a shortage, gas prices go up, people are afraid they're not going to be able to fill up their car, and the economy begins to falter. And then things go from bad to worse. On November 4th, 1979, uh, extremists seize control of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, which is the capital of Iran. And they take the Americans who are inside hostage, and they hold the, the embassy basically um, under under guard. Now, this is a big deal because a foreign embassy is considered like the soil of that country. It's not something that you can just walk in and take over, even though it's, it's in your capital. You're not allowed to do that kind of stuff. And so for the Iranians to do this and on top of that hold our people inside hostage, it, it was a major problem. It was a major crisis here in America. And one of the reasons they're doing this is uh, the Iranians wanted to force us to turn the Shah over to Iran so they could put him on trial and punish him, and we refused to do that. So you've got the energy crisis and the hostage crisis uh, kind of combining to weaken the Carter administration. People blamed Jimmy Carter for allowing this to happen and for not doing more to rescue the Americans who were there. And so in April uh, 1980, Jimmy Carter tries to rescue the, the hostages. Uh, this rescue attempt goes about as badly as it possibly could. Uh, the, the people who were supposed, supposed to be rescued were not. And about eight Americans who were in this rescue attempt died. So uh, again, just about as badly as it possibly could have gone. And hugely embarrassing for the Carter administration. Now, Carter is going to ultimately lose his bid for re-election in November of 1980. It's a topic we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but the hostages were finally released the day Jimmy Carter left office. Literally, right after Ronald Reagan took the oath of office, Iran let the hostages go after 444 days of captivity. All right, so we have looked today, guys, at environmental concerns. Uh, environmental setbacks, but also environmental progress and how it shaped American foreign and domestic policies. In our next video, we will finish up Unit 8, finally, uh, by looking at uh, Watergate and some other scandals.